Welcome to the Barrier Breakdown, Disrupting Mental Health Podcast, where we talk about the clinical and practical issues that face those working in the mental health industry. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of the Barrier Breakdown, Disrupting Mental Health. My name is Erin Molino bailey I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Cognitive Behavior Institute. And I have with me here today, as always, uh, our co-host, Dr. Kevin Caridad, the CEO and owner of Cognitive Behavior Institute. On today's episode, we have a very special guest. Uh, Dr. David Wenberg is here to join us today. And Dr. Wenberg is the CEO of Quartet Health, a technology company transforming mental health. He has a master's in public health from Harvard and an MD from McGill. And he is a member of the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and clinical practice faculty. Dr. Wenberg has extensive leadership experience in healthcare and some of his prior roles include senior scientist at Maine Medical Assessment Foundation, chief science officer at Health Dialogue, CEO of Northern New England Accountable Care Collaborative and Chief Science Officer at Quartet Health. So thank you very much for being here with us, uh, Dr. Wenberg. We're very excited to have you. Aaron, it's truly my pleasure to be here. Thank you. David, thanks for, for coming. Uh, why don't we start off telling us a little bit about Quartet and then a little bit about what brought you into the uh, behavioral health field. So Quartet is a... Um, is on a mission to improve the lives of people with mental health care conditions through technology and services. And essentially, we think about that in four, four sort of pieces. First is um, making it much easier for people to get access to care. And CBI has been a critical partner for us in being able to do that. The second one is to help uh, make it so that people on the access side can get to the right person for, the, for, the, for their conditions and needs. Um, through a variety of different technologies and, and analytics. The third is to improve the quality of care over time, or not to, not to improve the quality of care, excuse me, to get people to the right care, which includes quality of care. Uh, and then the last part is also the realization that, uh, because the realization that mental health care is a chronic condition, mental health conditions, excuse me, are chronic conditions with acute flare-ups, we wanna be the trusted partner for, for members and patients as they transition over time. So they think about us to help them get to care to excellent quality providers such as CBI. Great, uh, awesome. Uh, I know I've used Quartet for many years and uh, one of the reasons why we had you on, we know how it can really be transformative uh, in, in an open healthcare system. Tell us a little bit about what led you to behavioral health specifically. You have such a broad background. Uh, yeah, what led so you to- uh, Yeah, so like a lot of folks at Quartet actually, Kevin and Aaron, I came here um, first and foremost because of uh, challenges one of my kids had in getting uh, with mental health care. Um, one of my daughters uh, has um, pretty moderate to severe uh, OCD, uh, and she had been in needing of, of getting advanced care, more, more um, a, a cha- a, um, adjustments in her medications. And so she, we connect, she got connected to a psychiatrist um, who helped her get onto the right medication. But when the time came for her to, tr- she was actually on, um, on clonopan, clon- cl- clonazepam, excuse me, as a transition drug. Um, she was given a date to stop, but no written notice about a, a taper. And she got into pretty terrible withdrawal syndrome. Uh, and uh, despite reaching out to her, 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 her physician who didn't respond to her, um, she was getting more and more severe. She reached out to me and I basically had to intercede on her behalf. Um, she's great, she's an amazing person really like crushing it in her new world. Uh, but it was a realization, that was my, like the closest realization of how the separation between physical health and mental health care can create tremendous barriers and, and, tra- and, and problems for people who need care. And so I was on, I basically came here as a personal connection to it. And when I saw that at that point, 10 page pitch deck, um, I said, this is something that I think could really help people like my daughter who don't have a physician as a parent. And so, I jumped in full board, or, uh, full, full, full time with that, and I've never looked back. It's been such an exciting ride. Great. Can you tell us a little bit more about the specifics of Quartet and its reach across the country? Sure. So we are now uh, in the process of um, 
uh, moving to fully 32 states across the country. Uh, and the, the reach varies a bit from state to state. We're now, we will be in, in the first, at the end of the first quarter of 2021, we will be with what I would call full services and te technology and services in nine states. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means, Kevin, in a second. And sure. then in, in, um, in addition to those 10 states, we will be in another 22 states uh, supporting one of our key customers who, in response to the COVID uh, pandemic, needed access to telehealth care. And so in that case, that's much more of a telehealth play supporting local providers, which we'll come back to because we don't provide care, but we enable local providers to deliver care um, and get the patients to them. And so that's a little bit of a different play than some of the other stuff we've had. Uh, if it would make sense, Kevin, I can go a little bit deeper about what we do when we're in full. Yeah, yeah, I think it'd be this, great. This is a great example. So we think about this integration of care, primary care and physical health and mental, physical health care, excuse me, and mental health care is a critical aspect to health and care. Um, so in the Pittsburgh market, as an example, um, we work very closely with the large systems and smaller practices on the physical health side, uh, and then with stellar providers like CBI as well on the, on the mental health care side. Um, our technology allows uh, workflow integration on the physical health care side so that patients can be referred into mental health care. Uh, we use an algorithm that identifies the highest need patient, prompting the primary care physicians usually whether they, to alert them about needs to care. Um, and then we have a matching algorithm that matches the patients, what the patient needs based on their clinical needs and their preferences, um, and, such as gender or telehealth or physical health care in the post COVID time. Uh, and then that matching algorithm identifies the highest probability point uh, uh, provider for that person. We shepherd them to that care, and then we make allow the, the technology allows the mental health care providers to communicate back to the physical health providers, creating what we call think about as virtual integrated care. Now, I think that's great. I think one of the things I remember, particularly about the uh, algorithm and identifying those that are either undertreated behavioral health or not being treated at all, and it's triggered within the system and alerting the PCP, is we know that there's this large population that go unserved or unrecognized with an issue. And what it really began to do, and, and I remember this very much, so I think it was around the end of 2014, probably 2015, uh, June, uh, is that when that started, what all these clients had and coming, well, I don't think I have a problem is what they were saying. But when you look at the, the measures that, that would come across, whether it be a PHQ-9 or GAD-7 to really uh, surveil to see what's going on, they had, they had concerns. And then over time, you could just see how, uh, how the clients did better. Uh, and they were just, wouldn't have been identified any other way other than through this technology, which uh, for, the, for the first time, someone uh, on, a, on the behavioral health side was kind of like, this is pretty cool. Cool. I appreciate that, that, that shout out. I mean, it was, it was it's, and it's evolving all the time, as you know. Um, but it is interesting that 25% or more of the people we identified who are likely to need mental health care have never had prior treatment. And honestly, um, their physical health providers had never thought about it either. And so it's an interesting, and it does create some interesting uh, um, complications of the conversation because a lot of people, you know, don't, haven't admitted to it or don't even think about it. But it's a critical aspect of, of getting people better is, is to do is to really have that proper conversation, which you guys know so well about. Great. Could you, could you tell us a little bit about there are maybe some listeners out there who are not current quartet providers and they may be very interested in joining your network, so to speak. So could you tell us a little bit about, you know, who might be a good fit um, and how they could get connected with Quartet Health? Excellent, Erin. Thank you for that. Um, so the easiest way to get connected to, to Quartet Health is through our website, and we will give you that information later so you can su supply that to your listeners. Um, is, what we focus on, on is uh, identifying, we tend to do it by geography by geography. And so you'll see a lot of work in the Pittsburgh area, New Jersey, North Carolina, Washington State, and so on, with a lot of communications to identify people and pull them into the platform. Um, and we're always looking for good providers to join us. And it's a, it, unlike some, and maybe it's it's like thing is like we do have questions that we ask people about. We make we vet them to make sure that they have licenses and that they don't have any sanctions, et cetera, which I think is a really important piece of the of the of the journey. Um, and we are also careful to make sure we have um, enough patients or clients 
in the geography so that it's worth their time to, to join up. So, because one of the things that we learned very early on is that we try to bring, bring everybody in as we could in a, in a region before we had the, the demand on that side. And so we want to make sure it's a really good experience for the, uh, the providers in that case. And so sometimes we'll say, we'd love to have you on it. We're not quite ready yet. And that's really reason is because we want to make sure if we can get there, we can get them to the piece. Because we think the value proposition for, um, for uh, mental health providers is very high. I mean, first of all, we identify patients who are in need of care. The matching algorithm makes sure that they have um, that they are matched to the provider who treats that condition, who is open and ready for care, for, has open set, uh, slots. And then the other part that's interesting here is that both through the patient application, but also through our, our care navigation team, we help people get to care. So as you know only too well, one of the critical issues that providers have is that it's is the no-show rates. And so we've been able to demonstrate in, in, in geography after geography that we can decrease the no-show rates by basically supporting, nudging people to get to care. And so that you don't end up having open slots from that perspective. So it's a it's an interesting value proposition. One of the things I remember I liked about that was the matching also of insurances. So all that stuff's done ahead of time. So the system has a lot more detail than than you gave that I think would be great for people to follow up for uh, to see how, how, it, how it's a good fit for them. Thanks, absolutely. Kevin. Absolutely. It's all, I always forget about that stuff. <laughs> all those details that like, but insurance match is a really important one because you should, both of them. spend a lot of time. Yeah. And even, you know, having the, the member ID number and the group number and the patient's address and all that information that, you know, sometimes can take a while um, on an administrative side, that is kind of all wrapped up neatly, you know, right in one place when you go to accept the referral, um, as well as <clears throat> excuse me, some, some background information from, you know, the PCP that they can send over, um, which is, you know, really incredible also in case there's anything significant that sticks out that, that the clinician should be, should be aware of. Thank you, Erin. It's a really important piece because I think it's interesting. And, and this was what I think something that attracted you and Kevin very much to this uh, journey early on with us is the ability to actually have insights from the primary care physician about the needs of the patient, not just for their tradition, not just for their mental health condition, but for their physical health condition, because we know that um, the impact of depression, anxiety, or substance use disorder as examples on person's ability to manage their diabetes or their heart failure is profound. And so knowing how you can use that sort of to knit people together so you can create a therapeutic bond, in some sense allows people to overcome some of the stigma that's still available, that's still around. Um, if you talk about their diabetes, they don't care about to talk about that. Because, well, by the way, this can help you get there. So it's a really interesting piece. And yes, that, that information comes over from the primary care physician as well as the rest of the information. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I call those electronic warm handoffs. It's as, as close as you can get to not getting human there to really make, uh, be able to get that, that client to actually get to care. So I really appreciated that aspect of it. So one of the things that comes to mind uh, is kind of the longer term trends. For me, uh, that looks like, you know, year two to five years. What If you had a look at globally from across the country, what do you see are the three top trends that uh, as a outpatient private practice or small group practice or even uh, uh, an academic based group that has to that takes insurance? What are the trends you see coming that you think people should really prepare uh, themselves for? That's a really, really good question, Kevin. So I think the first is that, uh, and this has been well identified, but I don't think people have fully embraced it yet, is that um, you know, the 2020 has been a very tough year. And I think that as high, to, as, as, high as the needs in, of, the, of the population were for mental health care pre-COVID, COVID has exacerbated the needs. And I think the first thing I think is that if we thought we were working hard for forest providers, I think it's, it, there's, the need is going to be much, much higher. And I don't think it's going to go away post COVID. I think basically this has unlocked and destigmatized in many ways the uh, mental health care needs of people. And I think that's going to come through. The second big piece I think is that the need to do telehealth and video health as part of COVID is not going to be just about COVID. I am highly confident that post COVID, the interactions with clients will continue to be, the sessions will continue to have um, video and tell as part of that piece. I think what's interesting, and this is something that we've worked really hard on and that the aforementioned 
32 state rollout is that unlike some other models where they have a telehealth provider who just does telehealth, our primary model has been enabling local providers to use telehealth because we think two things. One is, is we have a strong uh, a bias that local providers are really good and we want to be able to support them. The second thing is we think post COVID that it's not gonna be telehealth or face-to-face -face care. It's gonna be a hybrid model where people will need or want a visit first to develop therapeutic bonds and then move into transitions into to telehealth or video health because it's much more efficient and it's easier to not have to do a work schedule time, things and things like that. But they'll also want touch points again. So I think one thing is telehealth and video health is here to stay. My gut sense that with our local team is that 50% of all interactions between uh, clients and, provide, and mental health providers will be not face-to-face -face post COVID. The third piece, and I also, just before I leave there, you can, um, is that I also think that the regulatory and payment models will reflect that need. I think there's a lot of momentum now to do that. In fact, uh, you'll see soon a thought piece coming out from, from us about that from a regulatory and, and a payment side. And then the third piece, and this is one I think that is gonna be interesting to see how it comes forward, is that um, while access is critical, access to the right provider who does really good care like CBI is also gonna be a really important foundational piece going forward. And so we put a lot of emphasis on, on value-based care for mental health care as a big next initiative for us. And I will tell you, it's getting a lot of traction from both providers because, uh, and from, and from the, those payers. The benefit to the providers is that um, in the, every circumstances now that we're working with, pay, with, a, with a health plan side on this, is there substantial increase in base rates as part of the value-based care. Now, it also means that we'll measure and identify people who are doing a good job um, and treating the, and basically improving the, the functional status of the clients, um, but that's good care. I mean, what we're really doing is we're rewarding people for the right type of care. And I think those that value-based care will become a, a important aspect in the, in the next generation of mental health care. I am hearing a lot about that consistently. And I kind of bring that question up is that value based or shared risk is another term that comes up. It's that, hey, we're going to give you uh, X amount of money and you may be able to do better from a financial perspective. And, you know, I think part of there's a paradigm, there's a cash pay paradigm in therapy, there's an insurance based paradigm. And some of it may come together where I think uh, perception of client or clinician about length of, of treatment and what that looks like. And at least from insurance based, I'm hearing that that's beginning to shift that uh, you could do length, whatever you want, but pure outcome. So what are they, what are you seeing? Because I think that'd be important for anybody uh, in any situation as a mental health clinician, a good job. I don't know what that means. What are you yeah. hearing from the insurance companies about what a good job is going to look like and how they're going to measure that so we can prepare? Yeah, that's a really good question, Kevin. I think at two, and I don't mean to toot our horn, although I'm going to do that a little bit. I think what's interesting here is that um, because of all the experiences we've had in multiple states and multiple payers and with lots and lots and lots of providers, they're actually looking to us to help that, that to define what quality means. And so here's the way we think about bucketing it. The first is um, speed to care and access is important. Uh, we know that, and you know this well, that if somebody is in need of care, the longer you wait, the less it, it, it's problematic. So one is that, that sort of speed to care. The second one is, as you also know, and you're, and you're the people who watch the podcast is this, that develop, developing that trusted therapeutic bond is a really important predictor of good outcomes going forward. And so, and there are instruments that measure that. And so we'll measure that bond. Um, the third part, and I think this is something that you know really, really well, is that measurement-based care is, has been shown to be really important. So measuring, PHQ-9 at baseline as an example, and then at four weeks, eight weeks, and 12 weeks, and showing that you can demonstrate improvement. And the metric we've usually used is, control, is adjusted for baseline, if you can use that nerdy term talk, a 50% improvement in the eight week time frame is something you would look for. And then for um, larger groups who are able to and willing and taking on risk, I think also showing that you can, you, that the, that the increased payment that you get for high quality can be offset by decreasing emergency room visits, as an example, um, is also part. Now that I think is gonna be more, so uh, that last piece in particular will be more appropriate for larger multi-specialty practices, just because you need the mix and also you need enough patients to come in for doing that. 
But to summarize it, I think it's, the foundation is, in, is showing that you can improve patient's functional status over, over time. To your point, we also strongly agree that short-term goal-directed therapy is, for the majority of, of clients, is the right, client, right treatment. Um, but you will be paid not on how long you do, but how well you get people better. No, I think that's that's quite the controversial thing to kind of. I'm, I'm curious to see how that maps out, and I think uh, you know, expert after expert we have on here, I'm kind of trying to find out what that looks like. Uh, it's a moving target at the moment. Because speed of care, you know, I can see how it's very difficult in this time. Uh, we were speaking with Allegheny Health Network, uh, Doug Henry, and one of the things he was saying about is this huge increase, forty percent increase in demand, and so. You know, when all the systems are overwhelmed, how do you measure speed to care? And, and it's just kind of a, a problem of where we are, not anyone specific. So it's complicated. No, I think I, all of this is complicated, Kevin, for sure. And I think that the speed to care has to be adjusted for this local supply. So, um, and we are, we work close enough with providers to know that. Um, and that, and also we have enough of the data to know that in this zip code, this is the supply. And so this is what you should expect from that perspective. I also think it's re really important, and this is part of it, and I'm, this is like, this has been a tough year for providers. Not only has demand gone up a lot, um, but for mental health care providers, it's just been a really, like for all providers, it's been a really challenging time. Um, you know, one of the initiatives we, that we've had that was really got a lot of support, uh, got, got a lot of feed, good feedback was we had a care for caregivers work that we did because just because you're a mental health provider doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that you don't need and, and uh, mental health care support as well. And um, it's, it's been a very well-received um, initiative for us. And so one of the things is to say is that when we thought about this and coming back to speed to care as an example is that we are very close to clinicians and we've developed a really strong relationship and understanding about that part. And so we, uh, and because the, the plans who are asking us for the strategic advice know that we can really make sure that it's appropriate for the local geography. Great. Any, uh, any final uh, advice you have for clinicians out there uh, with regard to uh, what to expect in 2021 or, uh, and then also how to get in contact with Quartet website or otherwise? Great. So the contact, the easiest way to get in contact with us is to go to our website, which is quartethealth.com. So Q-U-A-R-T-E-T-H-E-A-L-T-H.com. Uh, and that will give you all the contact information, but also sign up there that you can look at from that perspective. Um, so I think coming back for 2021, I think that we're still in for a pretty hard period for the next three to six months. And so first and foremost, I think it's really important for people to take care of themselves because if you don't take care of yourself, you can't help your clients. And so it's really important to make sure that you give yourself a break and, and really know that it's okay to ask for help uh, and encourage, and I encourage folks to, to be, to, to, to seek care when they need to. The second thing I, is that, um, I do think that the demand is going to continue to grow. And so it's a really good time to be a, a provider at this point. I mean, I think that your opportunities here, um, for new providers to come in, to get quickly fill up their pack, to get quick numbers of clients as well as existing providers to have even more precise identification of the right type of clients for them, I think is a really big opportunity. And third and, 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 not, and most important, I think, is that people in the world right now in the United States need really good providers. And so um, know that we value you a lot and that the world is like, finally, <laughs> it, I don't, I don't, I hate to say this, it's like, there is, it, it took, it's a, it's a, it's, I hate to say that it took a pandemic for people to realize that mental health is health and that mental health care is health care, uh, but take advantage of that. There is a lot of people pulling for uh, providers at this point. Wonderful. Great. Well, those those are our fantastic uh, closing remarks. And while we do uh, hope that 2020 one is brighter than 2020. I think those that that's very realistic. Everything that you had, had just said. So thank you very much. You know for those closing words and thank you so much for being here with us. Um, this was a wonderful interview. I know that our listeners will really enjoy it. We of course hope to uh, continue our working relationship together and continue to hopefully have you back on our podcast here in the future, David. So we we really appreciate you taking the time today. 
Aaron and Kevin on behalf of myself and Quartet um, Health. Thank you very much for um, inviting us to the podcast. Uh, I am more than happy to jump on any time for follow-ups as we go forward. And um, I wish, um, and I'm really excited about our continuing relationship with CBI. Thank you both. Wonderful. Thanks again. Well, thank you very much to all of our listeners today. As always, you can find us on Instagram at Cognitive Behavior Institute, as well as check out our website, www.cbicenterforeducation.com, where we have low-cost, robust, continuing education credits. Uh, we thank uh, Dr. David Wenberg and Quartet Health for being here with us today on The Barrier Breakdown. If our listeners would like to give us a review on Apple Podcasts, that always does help other listeners to find us. But we appreciate everyone uh, being here today and listening, and we all hope you stay, stay safe and healthy. Take care, everyone. Thanks for listening to The Barrier Breakdown, Disrupting Mental Health Podcast. Check out our website at cbicenterforeducation.com for more information and to learn about upcoming continuing education events.